And good evening, folks. Uh, let everybody know that we are recording the meeting tonight. Uh, I expect more people will be joining here as we get going. It's usually the way things happen. Um, so I'll start with some general things before we have Michael Stafford talk to us with exciting news from industry. Uh, folks have probably been uh, following all the political news and so forth. So there is uh, talk of a lot of things uh, happening in the EV world. And uh, that's always good to know. I won't uh, reiterate, I think a lot of people look at uh, electric.co and uh, inside EVs and a uh, number of other sites and uh, can get their news that way. Uh, more people joining here. Good to uh, see folks again via, via Zoom. We uh, still don't know, of course, when we will start up with in-person meetings. But we're thinking that we will continue to keep the Zoom going so that some folks, if they're on travel or whatever, uh, unable to make the in-person meeting, they'll still be able to take part, uh, ask questions of our speakers, and let us know how things are going with their projects and so forth, whether that's a uh, conversion of a car or a motorcycle or, or uh, something else that they've got going on. Uh, we... Uh, We'll be using the new TXRX location when we do start up again. And uh, that address will be spread out with folks. Um, we've been keeping in touch with the uh, folks at TXRX. And since uh, this virus happened to come in right over the time that they were transitioning from the old building where we used the classroom to the new building, um, we'll just jump right to the new building when we do start the in-person again. So that'll be good. And uh, I think they'll have a lot bigger facility at their new location. And uh, so that will be exciting. And as I said, by continuing to use Zoom, we will be able to uh, have everyone who wants to participate. Okay, admitting some more folks here. Yeah, okay. Okay. And uh, hope there's not too much sound in the background. My wife has also got a, a meeting going on currently, so. You might hear a little bit of talking over there. But there. There's no door between here and there, so I can't really do anything with that. But uh, okay, still adding folks as we go here. And uh, hey, Kevin. Yeah, I see you waving. That's good. Are you in Houston or somewhere else? Chicago. Ah, okay. <laughs> we can get you anywhere in the world. That's good. Okay, so Kevin will be our second speaker after Michael Stafford. And so that'll be good that we'll be able to catch up with things that uh, Kevin knows are happening in Houston. So that's a good thing. And- uh, Hey Dave, I got a question. Do you know how to share screen with the Zoom? Yeah, oh, down at the is. bottom. I see it. If you I see hover it. at the bottom, it will. And I already clicked onto the um, multiple. Um, which the person running a meeting has to, to uh, I don't know if I can change that by a default, it just every time I've had to go and select multiple participants can share simultaneously. Okay. Um, and then it seems to work after that. So that's one of those quirks with this software. 
So that's good that uh, you're set. And uh, so Michael, thanks for sending your slides in advance. So I have those, but if uh, it's okay with you, I think I'll just let you go ahead and share your screen if you can do that conveniently. And that way you'll be able to uh, advance the slides as you're talking. Sure thing, Dave, thank you. And I also have some video, but it'll run on my end over here. So people can enjoy something a little bit more interfacing and interactive than what I can do from the standpoint of just speaking. So I appreciate that. If you're ready yeah. to go, I'll give, it a, I'll give it a shot to go ahead and take over the screen. I'm gonna stop my video just so I don't tie up my uh, my bandwidth on this side. Okay. And, uh, you're, you're coming across great with your audio and video uh, view. So yeah, it, it is always exciting with uh, EVs to get to see video and, and so forth. How's that? We did. We have the endurance picture of the truck in front of you right now. Yes, I see that. Perfect. I think we're ready to go. All right. I well, will I'll just do a quick introduction for the the team here, and just give you a little bit of information and background on myself. My name is Michael Stafford. I'm sales director for uh, Lordstown Motors in the Western Region. I've been in the car industry and the vehicle industry mainly on the corporate vehicle side for gosh, now about 30 years. Um, prior to this, I was working with Tesla and Audi of America. And then uh, prior to that, I was working with a couple of different fleet management companies, which effectively work hand in hand with corporate users and being able to establish financing, uh, maintenance programs, fuel card programs, uh, IRS compliance, license and title, um, you know, anything that might be an ancillary service that helps support the vehicle. So I've got a vast knowledge on the soup to nuts, uh, everything that goes from the point by which somebody takes delivery of a vehicle to the point by which they finally dispose of the vehicle. All those things are cost related, time related, but it also comes back to how they see the vehicle in itself and being able to perform for them. So um, my role with Lordstown is to talk to a number of corporate entities to get them to look at this vehicle and potentially adopt this as one of their means for being able to lower their carbon footprint, but also hopefully in the long term, lower their total cost of ownership. What I'd like to do is just start and give you a little bit of the breadth of where we're at and what we're doing with Lordstown. Um, in November 7th, 2019, Lordstown Motors purchased the GM Lordstown Ohio plant with the goal of transforming the plant to produce the world's finest all electric trucks. It's worth noting that General Motors used this plant to last build the Chevy Cruze. This plant produced as many as 400,000 vehicles annually so we know it's a very capable plant. GM was looking to reopen the plant and as a result, they left it, the plant in great shape. Um, inside, there's literally thousands of robotic units waiting to be set up, reprogrammed along with numerous heavy duty stamping units worth millions of dollars. So we got this for a, seat, a real steal. And GM recently invested in a whole new wing, which is their paint shop. It's, it's incredible. In fact, it's, if you see my little um, arrow, it's circling the, the paint shop. It's four stories tall and it's state of the art in the process for being able to paint and final finish of the, finish of the vehicle. Because of the size and scale of this plant, uh, we have the ability to make it even more efficient and productive. We're planning on being able to build our battery packs at this location along with our in wheel electric motors. Each will have their own assembly line. Each will have its own quality control team for inspection and verification for final product. So we're really excited about this plant and its potential because of its size. Give you a little bit more information on the plant. You can kind of see it from an aerial view here, but 16 million vehicles have been produced from this plant. And it's supported by a field of solar panels. That's section H over here. That's a field of solar panels. So it's green energy for producing a green vehicle. I previously stated that the maximum production under General Motors was 400,000 units per year. With the more simplistic platform of EVs, we estimate the plant's production capacity to be at 600,000 units per year. It's if we get to maximum capacity, which is quite a bit more than anybody else right now is producing out there. Other than maybe Tesla, they're at 500,000, which we've probably seen over the recent uh, news over the recent days. But this plant is much like what Tesla's was. It's kind of funny, I've been to both, obviously working for Tesla, worked out of the Fremont plant and had seen it. And the GM engineers who uh, built that plant probably had a lot to do with this plant. This is a little bit newer plant, 
Um, but the layout and some of the configurations of those plants are very, very similar, but they're both extremely large plants. And this just tells you the investment that's being made in this plant and our future expectations on vehicles. We are not gonna be a small operation. We're looking to scale and looking to grow and at some point be exporting these products overseas. So it's a, it's a big, large operation. Six, 6 2 school, uh, million square feet of property at the plant. Um, just for comparison's sake, if you were to look at the O'Hare Airport and its four terminals, you got 4.8 million square feet. So just to kind of bring, bring it back to the scope and size, the enormity of this plant. Lordstown was founded by uh, Steve Burns. He's the former CEO of Workhorse. Steve was an integral part of developing the battery electric powertrain for the UPS delivery trucks. We got an executive team that's been drawn from a vast array of industry experts, people with experience from Volkswagen, Tesla, Nissan, Toyota, and other industry leaders. We have a number of GM staff that are with us and they make a great part of our team as well. GM's a partner of ours. It's a great relationship for us. When we purchased the plant, we also were able to get a parts deal with them, that, which allowed us to source parts at their cost negotiated by General Motors, which is a huge advantage comparatively to many other uh, startup OEMs. Uh, this buying power is unavailable to these folks. So we're in a great position for that. It's also one of the key aspects which will enable us to come to market quickly. We no longer have to recreate the entire supply chain. So we put together a kind of a high level overview of the truck cost related items on the left with specs at the bottom. And the range we built into this truck is at 250 miles. And this is effectively after interviewing a number of fleet customers, we found the average light duty truck to travel between 60 to 80 miles a day on average. Um, some drivers go 130 to 150 miles each day, but still we're, we're covering that. We figure 98% of the time, we're able to go ahead and with a 250 mile range, be able to cover the bases with regard to what most corporate drivers are doing on a daily basis. Uh, we've kept the range at a level which com completes the job, like I say, 98% of the time. And while reducing the cost of the truck and equipment with a smaller and lighter battery for a more optimal um, product that we're gonna be going to market with. Our thought is, is that why build it with the larger battery charge an additional $8,000 if we get an an another 100 miles worth of range. We're trying to make sure that we're keeping the cost down so that when the fleet buyers are looking at doing a total cost of ownership comparison, we're able to get them to convert over to electric. And we've done a preliminary total cost of ownership comparison against similarly equipped uh, ICE vehicles. In this case, it's an F-150. But in the example, the cost is based on a five-year 100,000 mile life cycle. We're using a national average for the kilowatt hour cost versus a national dollar per gallon cost. And we have this on our website. So if somebody wants to go onto it and play with it, just to kind of see what might be a little bit more reasonable for the area that they're in based on their electrical cost and price for gasoline, you, you're welcome to go in there and do that. But it shows right away that there's a huge uh, savings available for companies to be able to look at if they're thinking about converting over to an EV. So when, um, when you use an EV, one of the things that uh, people have to start re realizing is, is that you just eliminate, and you guys are aware of this, but it's, it's simple to understand once you're into EVs, there's no more oil changes, no more fuel filters, transmission repairs, belts, hoses, radiator flushes, spark plugs. I mean, there's quite a bit of savings achieved. We, uh, electric vehicles have the advantage of the regenerative braking. So where the vehicle slowed down by the motor uh, as it switches over to a generator during, you know, when you're letting off the pedal, but it dramatically also reduces the uh, brake wear. So um, what's not being factored is a calculation for downtime, lost productivity that an individual has when surrendering the vehicle for scheduled maintenance. So one of the key aspects that we're asked about is our specifications. We're often asked what the vehicle warranty is, et cetera. We've got it listed over here. People wanna know what the battery warranty will be is the battery is the most expensive part of the vehicle. And Lordstown's gonna have an eight year, 100,000 mile warranty. Uh, bumper to bumper is gonna be three years, 36,000 miles. The uh, four individual hub motors of the Endurance 
they combine for 600 horsepower, 150 horsepower out of each motor. Uh, one ton payload, 7,500 pounds of trailering capacity. <clears throat> You'll notice the top speed is listed as 80 miles an hour. That's actually a software governed. This is not the capability of the truck. It's simply what we've been asked by fleet customers to govern our vehicle at. So if we're selling to individuals who are buying this vehicle, we can set it up at the max rate. We haven't determined that yet, but it's well over the um, 80 miles an hour that's being listed here. But for fleet buyers, we're actually going to go ahead and allow them to tell us where they want to cap it out so that they're not subject to drivers taking the vehicle and using it to edit the excesses. Um, we also have uh, built-in telematic sensors on the vehicle as part of the factory offering, which is uh, key for a lot of people. And the endurance truck uh, is built to compete directly with the Silverado F-150 and the uh, Ram truck. So we've taken the best aspects in design from pickup trucks, which have been refined over the last 100 years and executed them onto an EV body. You've undoubtedly seen the skateboard design of other EVs. From a platform standpoint, from a platform standpoint, our feeling is battery vehicles are literally better by design when compared to ICE vehicles. If you think about an ICE vehicle, the engine and transmission are both above the wheel axle. Inherently, this creates a high center of gravity with most of the weight up front. The heaviest component of electric vehicles is, is the battery. And while the, the final weight distribution for our, our vehicle hasn't been publicized yet, it's worth noting that in the battery can be moved forward or aft on these skateboard chassis to be able, be able to arrive at a 50-50 weight distribution. So it's very similar to what you, know, you find top tier race cars being built around. And because we don't have an engine up front, um, we can manipulate that in a way that's really uh, beneficial to the, to the vehicle. From a safety standpoint, one of the other advantages is that we actually have these areas both up in the front and the rear of the vehicle that we can engineer and design as crumple zones. They act as dampeners, slowing the vehicle down, absorbing the kinetic energy with the goal of protecting the occupants in the truck cabin. So um, we're slowing the vehicle down in an engineered way. From an impact side, from, an, from in the event of an impact on the side of the vehicle, there's the frame rails, which surround the battery, which become a barrier, helping prevent major intrusion into the cabin. You can see on both sides there, there's heavy duty frame rails. And if by chance the impact is very severe, really severe, then the um, density of the battery also plays a role. These are very dense battery packs. You, you've seen them, you guys are in this industry, so you know how dense this might be. But this additionally is additional protection for that intrusion into the cabin. If you wanna go one step further, We've got these reinforcements that go across the top here, which are great for structural integrity and, and rigidity of the truck, but they also reinforce the opposing frame rails. And I guess the last fact, which you may be aware of, but batteries are 10 times less flammable than gasoline, so less opportunity for fire. Better built, better engineered, and better by design. That's our, that's our thought about EVs. We're really enthusiastic about this. Now, all this said, the past few slides, we've shown how we differentiate our vehicle against ICE trucks. In the same breath, not all EVs are created the same. A truck drivetrain will have four moving parts. Four moving parts, that's all. And which, you know, effectively is more simpler and less to repair, but it's simply something that you're going to see that it's exclusive to our product. We have this thing called the hub motor. Each wheel is installed over the hub motor that propels the endurance truck. So there's no axles, no gearbox, drive shaft, or transmission, making the vehicle more efficient and more powerful. Four separate motors, brushless AC induction motors, are mounted on each wheel. The hub motor wheel assembly is approximately 80 pounds. The suspension used uses heavy duty components and is tuned to manage the unsprung weight. Keep in mind, we're not building a race car here where unsprung weight is extremely critical. We're building a truck. Each motor, um, I mentioned this earlier, but it has uh, 150 horsepower. So the total is 600, but uh, from a standpoint of torque, 650 Newton meters or 480 foot pounds of torque. And there's no gears involved whatsoever. 
what I'm going to show you here is you're going to get a little video here. The hub motor system also has another uh, huge advantage. It allows us to control the power and torque and traction at each wheel. So the vehicle horsepower and torque are applied where it's needed, at the rim, directly to each tire independently, almost zero power loss as the engine is directly applied to the, as the engine energy is directly applied, uh, applied to the road. Result, we get better energy management. Our configuration boosts performance, improves drivability and traction. When road conditions present rain, snow, ice, mud, the power will be discontinued or applied to the tire, which has the grip at that point in time. And when turning the vehicle wheels, either left or right, we're able to go ahead and apply power and actually have the rotation of, say, in a left-hand turn, the outside wheel can rotate an additional two or three or 4%, depending on the turning radius of that vehicle. The inside tire will turn a little bit less. So these are some huge advantages in not only being able to make the vehicle track better, but it also provides less scuffing on the tires and adds longevity to those tires too. So a lot of, a lot of pluses to this. So what you're seeing now is that you're actually seeing the hub motor in testing. And the hub motors aren't new to the transportation industry, but they're new to the truck industry. We've licensed our hub motors from Elfie, which you'll see in there. You'll see their name on here in quite a few, quite a few of the uh, videos here. What you're seeing is a number of videos with a number of tests being applied to the hub motor to verify its durability in numerous conditions. You'll notice in the corner descriptions like um, high performance cornering, Load testing, you have the ice buildup test right now, shock testing, random vibration, salt mist right here, uh, water testing, mud resistance testing, power thermal cycling. Um, we dipped the, the whole uh, engine into water. There you go, salt immersion. We have a fresh water immersion. Everything has been tested to the nines. In fact, um, these motors have been reviewed and have reached a passing grade by United States Postal Service. The company which Steve came from, Lord, um, excuse me, the um, workhorse is actually using the, the uh, hub motors and their design for the bid that's being put forth to the United States Postal Service. And the Postal Service is looking to have their vehicles on the road for an extended term of 25 years. So you can imagine the longevity of these engines and the, their durability that they're going to have on the road on these trucks and, and the, the potential for long-term use. I like to think about it from the standpoint that, you know, when these AC induction motors are, were first introduced way back when by Nikola Tesla, I mean, they, they've been very durable, but now they're just almost indestructible. And I, I sometimes equate it to your local fan motor in a house. I mean, how often do you end up having that fan motor break? You'll break the switch on the motor or you'll break the, sw the switch on the fan or you'll break the uh, plug-in long before you break the motor. So going back to our truck here, our truck has a uh, covered storage area, 20 cubic feet up in the front under A there. Great for storing emergency equipment, tools, whatever you need to be secured. Our vehicle also uh, mentioned before, but it will have telematics as part of the initial offering. And we are also including a 20 amp power outlet at the truck bed towards the back there. So we built the truck to be competitively priced specifically for uh, the large fleet group, but it's also a great value for the retail buyer. Um, we know that a lot of companies in, are looking at this, especially utility companies and transportation companies. A lot of the government fleets were having a lot of interest uh, coming from them. Since it's unveiling, uh, it's been met with enthusiastic support. And I think we're right now close to 100,000 letters of intent on the pre-order. So um, we're happy to make that announcement, which you'll probably see in a couple of days here. But our platform is rooted in sustainability and the entire Lordstown team is committed to ensuring we contribute to a healthier planet for generations to come. And with that, I'll um, turn it back over to you, Dave, and uh, any questions that might be from the, um, the audience, if I can get out of the uh, share screen here. Yeah, that's very exciting. Really good to hear all those things, uh, especially about uh, how you're using hub motors. You mentioned the unsprung weight issue, which I think has inhibited a lot of manufacturers from going to them. So you, 
obviously don't find that the unsprung weight issue is, is a showstopper since you are using those. You, you see a lot of trucks where the aftermarket teams and guys come in and lift the trucks up and put them up high, you know, it can be, you have to have a ladder to get into them. But those trucks and the weight and the tires that they have on there are, are well over what we're doing. So we've taken mm -hmm. away from that technology to uh, effectively design the suspension so it's engineered for that additional weight. We realize it's a critical part of the vehicle's weight and mass. Um, let's not kid ourselves. But from the standpoint of being able to look at the application we're doing, we're building that, uh, we're building the suspension to be able to with, withstand the beating that will be taking place with that additional weight. We're not building it like a race car. If it was a race car that you probably won't see rate, uh, hub motors in race cars. We're looking for this for, as a longevity play uh, with, the, with the technology. And we think there's a huge advantage just from the standpoint of the traction on the vehicle and the way that we're able to go ahead and manipulate that uh, quite literally. I mean, you think about it, that rim on the vehicle is where the power is being directly applied to. And the only layer between that is the tire. So there's no, there's no way to get more direct power to the ground than the way we're doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have noticed other manufacturers talking about one motor per wheel so that you can uh, control and sense and so forth. So that's interesting about, um, cause I'm not technically uh, apprised in that area but that race cars would not be very good with hub motors but a larger vehicle is because of the different characteristics. Good, good to know. Yeah. 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 And you mentioned the post office, as we can all imagine. Yes, they, they want to go with longevity. And, and uh, we've heard that they are looking at coming out with a new generation of vehicles to replace their old Grumman mail delivery vehicles that most of us all know driving through our neighborhoods. And so, yeah, it'd be great if some of your technology got into the, uh, the new vehicles. Yeah, not to get too political, but I believe in 2008, they were about to go forward with doing electric vehicles and that got shut down because of some of the changes in the laws, which required them to go ahead and fund their health care for a 75 year period, which is sort of unprecedented. But you've seen the post office have been suffering from that standpoint. I think um, we'll see going forward a change in the direction. They do have a commitment to go forward with some form of a vehicle, we're, uh, I say we, but the workhorse, which is sort of a sister company to us, but they're actually in that final two company bid for that, Ford's the other one right now. Ford's actually got a uh, internal combustion chamber engine vehicle that they're looking the, on the bid. So we'll see how that plays out, but that's, that's a whole separate issue. I think the crux of this is, is that that motor that we're using is a larger version of what's being proposed by the workhorse folks. And from a betting standpoint, it's cleared the hurdle that the post office has had with regard to getting to the point where they're the one in, they're in the final two. Good. And I'm glad you referred to the other company, a sister company, because I certainly hope that technology gets licensed so it gets used where it's best to be used. So whether your company benefits from a licensing agreement or actual manufacturing or however, I mean, to be able to contribute to something like that, I think would be good. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, let's open things up. Uh, let's see, I see a raised hand here. Where is that at? Kevin. Kevin, Kevin. I think you're hey, muted. Hey, Michael. Thank you for a uh, great presentation. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about was, so we, we do uh, talk um, with, different entities about electrification, the city being a big one. And um, one of the things that we face in Houston is that the, the total cost of ownership um, pitch uh, sounds good, but it's, it doesn't match the way that the city purchases and fuels and maintains vehicles. Because uh, structurally, uh, the, the budgeting and financing of the, of the city and many public entities are like this, and I know that um, Proterra and others are, are fighting with this, is, is that you know they have a bucket and one management stream that, that purchases the vehicle, and then they have another bucket and management stream that fuels it, and another one that, and so, it really takes leadership from the very top, uh, the mayor, the city council, and that in that case, or upper level management to look at 
holistically um, the, the total cost of ownership of a vehicle. And you're absolutely right. It, it, it's, it is the way to look at this. And the financing aspect too, amortizing the total cost of ownership so that the, the initial price point of the vehicle is not a showstopper. Are you guys making headway? What, what feedback can you give us about when you're talking to folks and, and their receptivity to total cost of ownership and maybe uh, uh, barriers that you've come up with and, and, and solutions to those barriers? Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, great question. And there's a lot of layers into what you just stated here. So I'll try to start from the beginning. What we find is, is that in most applications with the municipal fleets, they're not able to collect the $7,500 federal tax credit, which is something that they're always, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a, that's a large amount of money to lay on the table and leave. Um, so what we found is there are a couple different companies now that I'm aware of that are able to go ahead and effectively apply for those federal funds and provide a portion of those back as part of the purchase of the vehicle. And the way they're doing it is they're structuring a track lease for either a year or two. And effectively, because they're the title holder on the vehicle, they're able to claim that tax credit. And then at the um, end of the year or two, whichever it is that they've assigned or set up with the city municipal fleet, they're able to go ahead and provide a segment of that tax credit back to them and then have a buyout number for them to be able to purchase that vehicle. So that's the first piece. And that helps make it a lot more affordable when you start taking thousands of dollars off the top of the vehicle. The second piece is that uh, I mentioned about the maintenance and I mentioned about the repairs. I mean, we're trying to build a vehicle right now that just does not require any scheduled maintenance. We're, we're looking at it. We haven't gotten to the point where we actually think we have that, but it's close. We still have to replace windshield wipers. You still have to replace brakes and tires. Those are normal wear and tear items. But beyond that, you don't have to stop. You don't have to pull it in for regular scheduled maintenance that you do currently and that that's a huge cost and i mentioned it during the talk but you know there's there's a cost of time and money to somebody for being able to pull that vehicle out of the fleet and have it in the garage for the day and a replacement vehicle to have on hand to be able to make that person still be productive so that's kind of the second piece i think the third piece that a lot of people overlook is is that these vehicles should outlast ice vehicles and so if you have a fleet or if you have a vehicle and right now let's just use the um the same example that was put in here earlier where you have a vehicle for five years and every year it runs 20,000 miles. And so at the end of five years, 100,000 miles goes by. That's about the time and place by which an internal combustion chamber engine vehicle is turned out in the fleet. You shouldn't have to do that with, uh, with a vehicle like ours. You should be able to keep that vehicle for quite a bit longer and still have the same reliability that you're looking for in a day-to-day -day driving, day-to-day uh, -day vehicle. Um, so that that safety and roadworthiness of that vehicle is, is able to be extended. So when you do that comparison, there ought to be a comparison that says, what are we doing today? What's our cost in the vehicle today? What would we anticipate if we were to go ahead and change over to an electric vehicle? And when you start drawing out the length and time by which you have that vehicle, the depreciation curve drops quite a bit. You have the savings with the cost of electricity over gas. You have the savings on the maintenance. The math is made up fairly quick. And that's kind of the discussion we start having with these folks because we're changing the perception and understanding of how they've been doing business the last hundred years to something new. So you're, you're correct. There's, there's, there's definitely a learning curve. And at some level, they have to be able to sell it internally. But at the point at which they're able to jump off and be able to go towards having uh, electric vehicles, they'll soon find out that this is an absolute win for them. The city of New York has actually put in a bunch of Nissan Leafs and they came back and their report shows that they're able to cut their maintenance by uh, three quarters over three quarters of the cost that they had prior to. So there is some uh, relevant data available right now. Um, this is new. We're a truck. It's a little bit different than a Nissan, but the same platform, same type of uh, expected drop in maintenance should be in our corner. Now the longevity thing, we'll see, but um, based on preliminary results, we should be fine. I will mention this is that when working with Tesla, we also had um, vehicles in the Netherlands, which were taxis. And you, I don't know if you guys have talked about this or not, but there's taxis that are up in Montreal. There's taxis in the Netherlands that have been there for years now. And this is the worst case use scenario for an electric vehicle. Think about it. You have drivers basically having shifts three a day. Vehicles go in, they get charged within an hour on a supercharging network. 
they come back out, they're put on the road for another eight hour shift. And then that driver comes back in and the same thing happens. That vehicle cycling from charge to empty, charge to empty. Um, it's, it's a lot of stress on that vehicle, a lot of stress on that battery, but they're getting over half a million miles of use on those batteries and those vehicles and not seeing a huge amount of degradation on the battery. And our battery technology is pretty much in the same line as what Tesla's is. So we don't expect a lot of difference with what we're doing. Yeah, and speaking of batteries and looking at the chat, there's a question there on batteries. Any information on the battery management system for the vehicle? So that's something that's still in that's still being engineered on our vehicle. I mentioned the 250 miles of range. That's without the vehicle being tuned. And that being that the algorithm between the body control module and, and the use of the battery to each of the engines has not yet been fine-tuned. We're looking at 250 on this as kind of the starting point. We have a 109 kilowatt hour battery, so it's effectively larger than the, the, uh, the Tesla has in it. Obviously being a truck, we're sitting up a little bit higher in the, the coefficient of drag, the body style in ours is gonna cause a little bit more drag and we're gonna be probably hauling a little bit more in weight overall. But the fact is, is that we should have 250 plus. Um, we're in that time frame where we're starting to build our betas right now. Uh, many of those are going to be destroyed by the NHTSA, which is the National Highway Transportation Safety Agency, for test, testing on its safety. Some will go to the EPA for uh, mileage rating, and then there'll be a few others that'll be second generation that we'll be able to you know, bring to different locations and show off before we st actually start real production. So um, it's a good question. I don't know how to answer it other than the way I just did, but um, there's still mm -hmm. some work to be done to be able to get that final um, um, mileage figure on the, on, the, on, the, on the battery itself. Okay, uh, next question. Any plans to build variants of the basic model? SUV, combo, welder, ambulance, armored cars? Well, I'm gonna be careful because we're publicly traded. <laughs> so <laughs> I can't quite say anything about what the future plans are. What we are gonna come out with is we're gonna come out with this endurance truck. There'll be two different bed sizes. We've already made that announcement. Um, but anything beyond that, I can't make any sort of uh, promises or, uh, you know, tip our hat on that. Okay, I understand. So, uh, Jeff, you indicated in the chat that you have a battery question. You want to ask I that do. One? I do. I'd like to know what your cathode's made up of um, and then what your energy density targets are for the internal and the battery. And then um, if you guys have thought about trying to up your either towing capacity or or uh, you know, overall moving capacity by sticking a battery in a trailer and figuring out how to hook a cable to the truck so that you can draw energy off the trailer uh, to either extend your range or extend your towing capacity. Because I've seen that um, in China, there was a company, uh, and I think it's public, but maybe I'd be better be careful um, as I've traveled a lot, but uh, there's a company doing that in China where they're messing around with just putting a, a skateboard together with a, it doesn't have all the motors, it's just a trailer, but they're getting the en energy off that. Um, and then, yeah, I guess the first question is probably. Okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. It's a, I mean, I haven't heard of that. Uh, and I quite honestly, I'm not the battery expert to be able to answer all the questions that you just uh, posed. So I need to do my homework on a little bit more of that area, but I like your idea. And I think that's kind of a unique uh, plan if you want to have something that goes cross country or a little bit further than what you uh, get from the standard configuration by the OEM, having something like that might be a, a great way to do it. Okay, uh, availability time frame is asked about. So production is right now geared towards uh, the plant being finalized and production will start in Q3, probably September of this year. We're going to be like, I, I, and I can say this, that I think it's, I think it's important that we've already stated, we're going to probably produce somewhere between 22 to 2,800 uh, vehicles next year, which is not much, but that's my design. They want to go slow. They want to make sure that everything is, that's being built is conforming to the engineer's design specs the spacing and fitting of the vehicle is conforming to everything we've, we've actually um, built with regard to the way in which it has been engineered. So we're gonna be very careful out the gate, make sure that everything is buttoned up. And as time goes forward, just like any other OEM, we'll be speeding up production and being able to get the uh, higher volumes of vehicles coming out of the factory. But um, initially a little bit slow. So 
if you're looking to have a Lordstown vehicle, get your name in now so we can go ahead and get you on, in line for the vehicle. And we are, we're happy to go ahead and collect those orders and be able to have my hand. Um, most of the time when you look online, when you're doing this, the, the, there's $100 down that's refundable if you don't want to take the vehicle. We're not going to charge a thousand or anything like that. We want to make it easy for people to get into the vehicle. Good, very good. Next question, what is the range fully loaded? And I'll even add uh, with towing, because we all know that electric vehicles with towing get greatly affected. Yeah. Yeah, that's a tough one to answer because, again, you're going to have to go back to the conditions that are around the vehicle. As you know, when you start getting colder weather and or the, the topography or even you can even get down to the point where if it's, a, if it's you know, effectively um, uh, the weather, if it's a rainy day or otherwise, there's, there's going to be a little bit of a delta in how that, is, how that range on that vehicle is going to be um, uh, uh, made. But like most EV manufacturers, the body control module that will be on the vehicle will adjust. So if the vehicle is towing a 7,500 pound trailer in the back, it'll go ahead and it'll modify the range on there. So instead of say 250, all of a sudden when you're driving, you'll see that it'll have maybe 240 or 230 or whatever the mileage might be based on its use of energy at the point by which uh, the, the vehicle starts recognizing how fast and how long that battery is going to be able to uh, maintain the speed by which it's being driven. You're on mute, Dave. Yeah, double cab with a short bed. This is the standard model? Question mark. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a it's a full crew cab. Uh, the bed is five foot six on the short bed and uh, six foot five. I think it's the other way around on the long bed. Okay, good. What type of battery architecture, cylindrical or pouch? Cylindrical. That's a short and sweet answer. Okay. The lack of an axle would seem to pose significant limits to payload and towing capacity. I imagine they're talking about a solid axle across where with a lot of other vehicles have. Yeah, so the, the rear axle, there is a rear axle. It's just a straight axle without, um, you, you've seen them on all these ICE vehicles. They have a gearbox back there, but this is this is just missing that gearbox and it's a straight axle in the rear with leaf spring um, supporting it. Leaf springs have been around since the stagecoach. It's reliable. It's- Right, right. So, the, uh, so the load is vertical, but you don't have that sort of uh, torsional load that you have on, a, uh, on an idler wheel. Yeah, I, I believe we're on the same page on that, but yes. Okay, great. Okay, good. Um, will you produce two-wheel drive trucks? Cheaper and many fleet managers probably do not want their employees driving around in 600 horsepower trucks. No, no, because the hub motors are basically going to effectively be the, uh, the drivetrain for the vehicle. I think it's gonna be a better, put it this way. Um, we th we, I think that's been thought about, but given the fact that if you have the four motors on the vehicle and much like you see on other vehicles, and I'll, I always go back to my Tesla experience, but they're, they're uh, dual motors, they get better range. They have better performance. And so if you're able to go ahead and add that one feature on the vehicle, without a whole lot of lifting, which, you know, this vehicle platform is fairly simplistic in the way that it's been engineered and designed. It should be something that is a, an extreme benefit for minimal cost. So in answer to your question, I don't see that on the horizon. I think there are always gonna be four hub motors on the vehicle, create that balance. Um, the torque vectoring piece is gonna be something we're gonna actually engineer the vehicle. Some vehicles initially, I believe, will not have that. That's gonna be kind of the second generation vehicle, but uh, I love that feature for the simple reason that the, the vehicle will corner like a go-kart, given the low center of gravity and given the fact that you have four wheels that are basically synced up to be able to uh, address whatever the road conditions are and also the turning radius of whatever turn they may be going into. It'll be computer controlled so those tires are, there's just literally no scuffing. So there should be an advantage just on the standpoint of um, tire wear and longevity for the tires comparatively to where current vehicles are at today coupled with the fact that traction should be unmatched by anything else out there today. All right, that sounds really good. Uh, I think a lot of folks, when they get used to four-wheel drive, they 
really like it because they end up in some environment that they didn't expect to be in. And uh, then they appreciate uh, being able to get out of sand or whatever they might happen to find themselves in unexpectedly. Okay, another question. Using a hub motor has a number of benefits but reliability of any system drops as the number of components increases. Are there other configurations with fewer motors? Maybe I'm I think he's already answered that. He said uh, that no, that this is a problem. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say, unless you wanted to uh, add more, I think you've, you've, you've hit on that. I think if you have right now with four moving parts and basically that's the motor itself uh, on each one of the uh, wheel hubs, it's harder to get anything fewer than that. Maybe like you said, if we just did a two wheel drive vehicle and just had some axles and, and the front where you just had that floating, that might be, you could reduce it. But um, for now, four moving parts, it's hard to, uh, hard to get anything less. Yep, that's sounding good. Okay. Um, type of charging connection and charging capacity. Yeah, it's going to use the uh, J717, what, what, excuse me, the J, J connector. Yeah, J1772. Yeah, 1772. It's just slipped my mind, but yes, that's that's a connection on the, on the uh, truck. Cool. In, including also the two lower DC pins that sure. makes it a yeah. CCF. We're going, have level two, we're going to have level one, two, and three charging capability. Okay, so both AC and DC. All right, very good, very good. And uh, charging capacity, I guess they're talking about how many amps it would be able to charge at. Yeah, I I, I don't know that, actually. yeah, I don't know that that's been uh, announced yet. So um, I've heard some numbers, but I, I don't want to state anything that I, I don't have that exact number. So it hasn't okay. been, I don't think it's been finalized yet. Again, this is part of the battery um, mm -hmm. piece that they have still yet to uh, finalize some of the configuration and, and, and are working towards. And once those facts are made available, I'm sure we'll have it on the website. Right, and all of our folks will be able to go back to your slides. We'll post them on this, our website as well. And at least at the 120 volt uh, level, I think I remember seeing something about 20 amps. But, uh, all right, what is your company doing to expand charging infrastructure? Some jobs are remote far from towns and cities. Yeah, so it's um, interesting. Um, we've been approached by just about every uh, charging company in the world. It's like the pinata at a 10 year old's birthday party. Everybody's hitting us for wanting to be able to supply us charging stations. So we haven't been focused on that at this point in time, but those discussions are ongoing and it's more than likely we'll have a white label product that comes from a company that actually produces charging stations already. So, um, you know, uh, that's about as much as I can tell you in that space, but um, we're not going to be building and making charging stations. Somebody else is really good at that right now, and we'll just find out who we want to partner with, and uh, we'll go forward from there. Okay, good. Question, thinking about four-wheel steering in the future. Uh, it has been discussed, but I don't know where that's going to go, and if I, again, uh, if, I can't say. Okay, well, I can just imagine that's as we know with all engineering projects that increases complexity, which increases cost. So you have to balance those things out. Obviously you want an affordable vehicle, um, but uh, yeah, who knows what the future may bring as you bring more models out and uh, what there's demand for. Yeah, we wanna make sure that we're keeping the price on the vehicle at a point by which it's palatable for most. Um, there's other companies that have chose to be lifestyle type vehicles. We're kind of looking at this from the standpoint of building something that's more day-to-day uh, -day use, uh, commercial and rugged longevity is going to be key, low maintenance, those things that people look for where they buy the product and they're not looking back on anything other than using it uh, from the standpoint of its its day-to-day -day application. Um, I think one of the things that also comes into play with cities and, and fleets is just the knowledge of knowing that that vehicle is going to be able to withstand whatever punishments put out by those drivers. When you start looking at the, the municipal fleets and city fleets and stuff, those vehicles are typically, I don't know if you want to say abused, but they're just not taken care of in the way that normal people take care of their own vehicles. And so we're, we're building it with that in mind. Okay, good. Well, yeah, I'm glad you're addressing both the individual purchaser market and, of course, you've talked about fleets. And I'm always telling people, yeah, you have to look at total costs. I really kind of get frustrated when you hear about somebody, whether they're buying a car or a personal truck, 
go to a dealership and all the dealership talks about is your monthly payment. And right. it's like, do you know how many years you're going to be paying that? Because they keep on upping how long those loans are. And if someone just looks at the total cost of ownership, like most fleet managers do, I think any good fleet manager, I mean, they've got to be looking at that. Yeah, I would right. individuals would too. You're absolutely right, Dave. I mean, I've been doing this, I've been in the industry for, I mean, like I said, umpteen years when I was working with the fleet management companies, that was the key process that they looked at was total cost of ownership. And you think about their position within the organization, they're managing 100, 200, 5,000 car fleet, whatever it may be, the multiplier for whatever they adopt is going to show up very heavily on the balance sheet that they, that company carries. So if they're doing a hundred vehicles of any magnitude, then they're living with the DNA of that vehicle, be it the mileage rating, be it the safety rating, be it the, the maintenance that happens on the vehicle. All that stuff is pretty much built in from day one, including the depreciation of that vehicle. So they do their homework. And we, we as a company are betting on the fact that we're going to be able to reduce that cost. And that's where we're looking at being able to help these companies be able to reduce their <clears throat> TCO on their fleets with electric vehicles. And that was our main impetus at the point by which this vehicle was First, the visionary Steve Burns built this uh, model saying there's, there's a gap that's yeah. easy to fill. There's, there's definitely a need in the industry for this type of truck. And so here we are. Very much so, yes, yeah. Um, so someone is just asking me more details about the battery design, more than your one word answer. You yeah, about- so I'm, I, I apologize, I'm not all that, uh, versed at it. I can tell you the size of the battery um, from a component standpoint. Uh, LG is the main component that we're using. Um, the packs themselves, like I said, we're going to be basically, we're, we're scheduled to go ahead and it's already started. Our assembly line for the battery is already effectively, uh, it's not working yet, but it's pretty much to the point where it's being completed. Um, there's actually a call for battery pack producers out there in the industry. And I think this is going to increase over time. And these may be sourced to other companies. Um, you know, there's there's just a huge demand for that piece. And, and I don't see that declining as time goes forward. You've seen again, I'll go back to my old company with, with Tesla, but they got the Gigafactory out there. And there's a reason for that. Mm-hmm. Um, they, there's just going to be a huge demand as time goes forward. Uh, my, uh, my other former company, Volkswagen, is building a, a plant in Germany, I believe to be able to produce batteries and battery packs. And so um, this is gonna become more mainstream for OEMs in order to be able to reduce their overhead costs as time goes forward and be competitive is to have that capacity to build their effective engines as time goes forward. And that's the battery pack. Yeah, so one aspect that a number of our members look at that you probably don't think of from your point of view is they, they like to know how many individual modules there are because they like to take a vehicle maybe it's been crashed or something like that and make use of the battery and, yeah. and so they, they like to know those kinds of things but that's fine for tonight's discussion uh, yeah. as you say more information will be coming out on the lordstown website as time goes by yeah i apologize i know that a lot of the folks out there are are, are just enthusiasts and they look at this from a micro level i haven't got my battery knowledge up to where it needs to be so thanks for keeping me in check. And that's something I need to do is a little bit more homework on where we're at and what we're doing for that. Some of this stuff, like I said, hasn't been finalized, but um, as time goes forward, there'll be a lot more information out there on the product and on the vehicle with regard to those technical items that you're speaking to right now. Um, that stuff is not public and I need to dig into that and find out a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Uh, more live questions from folks. People interested in getting and one, Dave. So I had a meeting earlier. Actually, I had two meetings: um, the Department of Transportation in Pennsylvania and the Department of Transportation in California. We met with them earlier this week. Um, their models are still predicting the average weight of uh, vehicles on the road to go are, are is going up as the sales of EVs trend up. Both California and Pennsylvania have similar models. So, have you guys built any value props? around, uh, since this vehicle is lighter than an F-150, right? I saw it when it was in Houston. Yeah. Your, your endurance is lighter, right? Uh, 5,300 pounds. Okay, so have you, put, have you put any value props together for that for like state departments or DOTs um, as far as uh, uh, if, if you start replacing more, ve- more EVs that are lighter on average versus heavier on average in the ICEs? Because as the 
as the number of EVs go up, the models that we're getting from the DOT departments are showing their gas tax val their, their their gas tax revenue going down. So their ability to repair, maintain, and replace roads gets more difficult. And um, one of the major things that they're looking at, at least in the two that I've met with so far, um, is the average weight. And so every every vehicle that they're looking at compared to its ICE replacement, uh, the average weight goes up. So yours goes down. It's I think you guys have a really unique, very uh, interesting solution. Um, but every time I, I mention that, I've already mentioned Lordstown to about a dozen companies. Um, nobody seems to know that fact. So yeah. you put any data or value props together for that? No, it's an interesting question. Um, I think that by the fact that we scaled back a little bit more on the battery than some of the other guys out there, we are able to save weight on that vehicle because going back to the original value proposition, if we're able to cover the bases with 98% of the fleet drivers out there and hopefully most of the retail drivers, we're in pretty good shape. And by not having a larger battery and not weighing down the vehicle and not having to have that additional weight just be effectively a drag on the rest of the vehicle's performance and, and capabilities, stopping, accelerating, all the other things, we're, we're doing a pretty good thing. We could, we could increase this size battery on the vehicle, the cost would go up, but then you know all the other dynamics of the vehicle would change too. So um, I like your question. I'm not sure how to answer it other than we're gearing this to be something that um, for the fleet market will be something that's more palatable for them from a cost standpoint and hopefully um, from, from the operational usability standpoint and, and, it, and its flexibility long-term. One of the things I didn't mention in the discussion was that we've actually, with the uh, parts deal that we've got with GM, we've been able to build the vehicle so that the, the frame rails on this vehicle match up with that of the Silverado truck. Where this is critical for government fleets is, is that there's a number of truck bodies that are already created for that Silverado truck. So it's literally, if it goes to an aftermarket upfitter like a Nap Hyde or Adrian or you know Auto Truck Group or whoever it may be, um, the engineers there don't have to go back and re-engineer that truck bed or body for our vehicle. It's li literally plug and play by comparison to what they've already built for the Silverado truck. So. That's a huge plus for them. It allows us to go to market without having to, you know, uh, wait years for them to come up with bodies for our customers. And um, as time goes forward, that that should be a that should be a big big plus or component uh, that'll help us go to market much quicker and, and be successful. That that is interesting that it matches up. So yeah, I'm sure that will help on the engineering and. And I hadn't thought of the aspect that Jeff brought out that the different state departments of transportation are looking at, yeah, what's happening with their taxes and the road maintenance. There are Jeff, some Jeff, numbers. Jeff, I was gonna say, Jeff's absolutely right. And I think different states are looking at this. They see the EVs coming and it's, you know, forget about Lordstown. Like I mentioned, there's Bollinger, there's Rivian, there's Nikola, the Tesla's already done this stuff. You see Polestar out there, Lucid Motors coming to market. I mean. And even the OEMs that are currently existing, Ford and General Motors making their announcements, Volvo, Audi's got their products out there. I mean, everybody's coming to market with these products. So as time goes forward, again, forget about Lordstown. They've got to figure out how they're going to go ahead and get those road taxes paid for. And it'll probably shift to something else. But um, at this point, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't know what to say there. It's something that uh, lawmakers are going to have to tackle and, and come up with some solution. There was an article in uh, one of the Houston papers over the last week that talked about a, uh, you know, one of the proposals being kicked around. It's a fairly modest amount. It's on the order of $100 a year, which doesn't really change the economics substantially. It makes a dent, but not a very big dent in your five-year plan. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, you're going to have different laws being proposed and different laws implemented state to state, just like we do uh, right now. They all have their own budgets and their own requirements, but um, it's true. The road tax thing has taken a hit already, but the fact that COVID's come into play because the stay-at-home orders that are in place across the country have caused the, uh, the, the, the market to collapse from a tax-based standpoint. And so um, there's going to be a lot of, there's going to be a lot of wrangling going on over the next year or two with states and municipalities and cities trying to be able to balance the budget that they've got. Yes, that is something. Um, so there are some numbers in the chat, and I was kind of also wondering a basic F-150. I was thinking of 
wouldn't really be 5,000 pounds. So someone researched it and came out with 4,000 pounds. And then to balance it off, the F-350 is 5,800 and some pounds up to 7,000 some pounds. So yeah, there's, there's uh, the different sizes of uh, Ford vehicles there um, to compare to yours. Um, so another question, how does the Lordstown truck compare to the Cybertruck? Tesla. I don't know. We haven't had this. We haven't seen much of the Cybertruck. I think the. Um, I, I think the the Cybertruck is is going to be something that will probably be a real good vehicle for those Tesla fanatics that love the whole thing that Elon's got going out there. It's it's certainly a different looking product, and I think it's going to be palatable for a lot of people and not so much for others. Um, We'll see long term. Um, it's pretty. It's 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 got some cool features to it. I I don't I don't uh, downplay what they're doing. I think they've always got something new and something cool. Um, we're looking for something that's a little bit more modest. One of the things that we found, and even speaking with a number of these um, fleets that we're talking to, city managers and whatnot, they don't want something that looks awkward like a Tesla. They want something that looks more mainstream. And I think a lot of people that are getting out of ICE vehicles look for something that is a little bit more closer to what they're used to than something that's just, you know, a totally different animal. Um, transitioning people to EVs is going to take a number of different approaches and ours is just one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. As all of our club members know, we're, we're constantly being asked by folks as we're driving our vehicles around. We stop in parking lots and so forth. We, uh, we're always getting grilled about charging and things like that, which later in this meeting, I'll bring up some more things about charging as well. So uh, a comment from Robin is a Rivian is more compatible. So Robin, what exactly you're referring to, which parts being compatible? I think you're muted, Robin. You're right, you are. Um, I, I actually mistyped that. I, I meant to say it's, it's more comparable uh, okay. <laughs> from a design standpoint with the... With the Silverado and the rails and such. Okay. Yeah, right. so what I understand with the Rivian and what I've seen of theirs is their, their product will be coming to market. Uh, probably this, it's gonna be coming to market this year. I think they're looking at the start price, somebody correct me here because I don't know exactly what it is, but it's somewhere in the high 60s and ours is at 52.5. Um, I think they're looking at more of a lifestyle vehicle. When you start adding that additional cost, um, I think when, you know, we're talking at least 12 to $15,000 more, somewhere in that ballpark when it all is said and done. Um, it's not going to be something that a lot of fleet buyers will probably go for, but for the retail market and somebody that wants that cool factor and they certainly have some neat stuff going on where they came up from South America and that whole uh, trip they did. It's, it does, it has that attractive uh, feel to it. And I think uh, I'll give credit to Elon. I mean, they basically started this whole, uh, they basically started this whole market by saying, Hey, we're going to go ahead and uh, transition the world to sustainable energy. They knew that this wasn't going to be done by themselves. So, I applaud Rivian. I applaud all these companies that have come to market after the fact and are now trying to push forth the EV movement because we do need sustainability. This planet is, is, is basically gonna get a little bit too hot too quick. So we gotta do something and everybody that comes into this market and makes an effort to try and or succeeds at it is a plus. Absolutely, absolutely. So any more live questions for folks? We'll wrap it up. Well, this has been great, Michael. I really appreciate taking your time. And uh, you're welcome to stay on, of course. We're gonna be talking with Kevin about things specific to Houston. And then I'm gonna talk at the end about uh, charging and, and some things like that, which uh, is always a topic that, that comes up. Um, well, thank you, Dave, and thank you. Thank you for the rest of the team there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have this time with you guys. and. Um, uh, look forward to any other conversations that you might have going forward. And uh, again, appreciate the time. Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're welcome anytime to come and listen. We have these meetings once a month and, and uh, always are talking about different aspects of EVs. So yeah, 
So thank you very much. Yeah. Excellent. Different, and different people applauding electronically here. Yeah. <laughs> can, uh, I'm, I'm Dale Cephas. Yes, can you Dale. Hear me? Uh, you have I'm, a question, Dale? I'm a long, yes, I, I do have a question. I've come in okay. late. I apologize. I went, was at church. Um, and But I've been a long time member of the Houston Energy Electric Car Association, probably 15, 20 years. When he used to have a guy by the name of Dale run it. You know, I don't know if you remember that. He's deceased. Yeah. Now, but he had three electric cars. And I've my electric car run eight feet the other day. But uh, the, the airplane only run 80, so what the hell? Nevertheless, I would like to ask the host a little bit, or the guest, um, when are we going to get cars that are small, small electric cars that are commuter cars? I don't want a powerful car. I don't want a big truck. I want a commuter car that can go around a little bit and get around town. And, and I personally, I didn't hear the first of it, uh, I certainly think strongly about the motor in the hub. I, I, that's my car. That's the one. I, when do you think we're going to get cars that are commuter cars in the community? I don't need to go 75 miles an hour. If I go the speed limit, I'm happy. Give me, give me your thoughts. Sure. There's, there's, a, there's a company called. Um, E-mobility, or I'm, I'm trying to remember who I, I've seen it. Pardon? Candy. Candy. There you go. Candy. There's, candy. K a n d i. You can buy a twelve thousand dollar commuter car. Very nice. Right. So there's going to be a different solution for what Dale's looking for here, but everybody's coming to market with something, and they're particular segment, you've seen commuter vans where they basically are looking at, uh, you know, populating the cities where they have electric vehicles that are going to be autonomous that they're talking about bringing to market. You see things where Mercedes is building, building or planning to build uh, vehicles where you go, you go take a nap in the car, you go lay down and you can be transported from point A to point B. Um, it's going to be interesting that this next 10 years, beyond the fact of what happens from uh, the EV space with autonomous vehicles and 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 effectively everything that's coming to market with how things are going to transition as time goes forward it's going to be be a complete 180 comparatively to what we've seen over the last 20 25 years so uh, hang on it's 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 going to be a real fun time yes there's lots of other changes we haven't spoken about autonomy tonight but there's been times we have before uh emma did you want to say something Yes, hi. Um, yeah, I'm glad you guys can join us uh, for our meeting. Were you, were you here when, um, actually in Houston, when you guys demoed the the truck? Uh, no, I wasn't. Um, okay. I wasn't a part of that roadshow, but that was uh, some of my colleagues that were involved. Right. Um, I mentioned to them, so I'll mention to you now that um, it might be interesting if it works into y'all's schedule to uh, come down in, I think it's April, fully charged is gonna be in Austin. Um, and that might be just a great opportunity for you guys to uh, interface with a whole lot of other okay. electric car enthusiasts. Okay. Yeah, and we can provide you with that information. We, um, and yeah, hopefully it'll be helped. If you want, yeah. send that to Dave and then I'm sure he'll forward it to me and I'd be happy to go ahead and put it on the calendar. Uh, for us to be able to have at least in mind and being able to attend we get a, we get like most OEMs we're being asked to attend every auto show out there most are charging some phenomenal amount of money and we're still a startup so we're gonna have to pick and choose where we go ahead and place our bets and make sure that there's some return on investment for it because we're obviously in the business of not just producing EVs but being able to stay afloat and make some money at some point in time sure right yeah and the a, a comment from one member to Dale that uh, the candy presentation from that manufacturer is uh, recorded and available on our HEAA.org website. So Dale, you can check that out. Thank you very much. Yep. All right. So again, Michael, thanks. You can stay on and, and hear the rest of the things and you're welcome every month as well. We really appreciate uh, all the information you've provided us and, and all the enthusiasm that your company has 
uh, as you say, there's lots of players. Yeah, thank you. And I, I, I appreciate the opportunity. And maybe we'll get back here in a few months here and hopefully give you guys the update and see where things are at then. Yep. Okay, good. Take care. Thanks. Yep. And uh, Kevin, are you ready to get going or we can talk about some other things first? I'm, I'm ready whenever you're, uh, whenever you're, you want me to do, you want me to do it now? Yeah, let's have you go now. All right. Uh, good evening, everybody. Good to see you. As click and clack would say, and I said you wasted another hour and 20 minutes of your precious day, <laughs> but not really because we all love this stuff. So uh, I'm going to talk about Texetera <clears throat> and it's not just Houston, Dave, it's Texas. And I stand corrected. I'm going yeah. to start off by asking, we're going to start off with a pop quiz. And this group is, is going to have an answer. I saw Bill Starr on here and I knew he would have the answers. But, so how much wind power is the rated power for Texas? Does anybody know that number? So you want something in uh, megawatts? Yeah, that, megawatts. Power. Well, I'll, it's, I'll, so uh, I don't see that keeps, jumping. Keeps moving. I, I think that we're over 20% now of the grid power, but of course that also increases year by year as the population increases as well. I, that's correct, over 20%. But the power rating is 30,000 megawatts of wow. wind that if you were to power a house and the house pulls about five kilowatts running an air conditioner that's six million homes so i just wanted to put that into perspective six million homes of wind and and my next question is does anybody know when the first wind power generator power was installed in Texas. And that one's mm -hmm. a harder one. And the, the idea was 1999. So let's just say 2000 and we're in 2020, finish that, that wonderful year. So I'm going to share my screen. By the way, Dale, there's the candy. Um, they got a ten, twelve thousand mo, uh, twelve thousand dollar one, and a and a twenty thousand dollar one, and and uh, it's right up your right up your alley. So there's the candy. So now let's let's do this little uh, no, this one. Can you guys see that? It's it's unfortunate that I can't make it much bigger, but. It, let me know if you can't, but this is the year 2000 and Texas was, was producing, uh, 15 kilowatts, 15, uh, 15, 115 megawatts, 115 megawatts. And you see the, that big curve will go up, go up to 2019, which is under 30 thousand megawatts it's over 30 it's 30,500 and if you can imagine that slope continuing there's graphs that show what it's what we're what we're going to be doing uh, through the next decade it's it's um uh, wind is going to uh be a third of the power generation in the state of in the texas grid so how does this happen? Is it is it that that people say, you know, marketplace, I want I want you to I want you to I want my electricity to be wind generated, or is it that the marketplace says, ooh, there's an opportunity to make money, and um, and uh, some of it is public incentives, and some of it is is uh, just technology technology has reached a point in which um, 
um, there's a potential to make money with it? Or is it visionaries that say, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity. The technology is here. We should develop a, a wind power generation in the marketplace. So it's, it's not the first one. It's not the people, there's a, you know, maybe 10 that want wind power out of millions. It's not the marketplace. It's not the established power coal at that time of producers, some, some hydro, some nuclear. It's others that are visionary and see a, a, a place and the Clean Air Act and other legislation that puts forth uh, money to uh, incentivize the marketplace to go in that direction. So the reason I start off with wind is that I'm going to tell you who Texetera is by, in this day and age, going to, let's see if I can, no, I can't get to my, there we go. This is a la 2020 Facebook, social media, where we can uh, uh, now, we don't just uh, approach the marketplace with websites, we approach it with social media and, and Texedra, Texas Electric Transportation Resource Alliance. So of you guys, and you can put it maybe in the chat. Dave, you can tell me how many know what Texetera is or heard of it in the group. And, and as you're maybe toweling up your hands, raising your hands or putting in a number, Dave, you can share that with me. But Texas Electric Transportation Resource Alliance, by the way, the Houston Electric Auto Association, we are a member of it. They are a nonprofit coalition of clean energy professionals working to transition Texas to a zero emission electric transportation future. Our members include researchers, manufacturers, policymakers, utilities, distributors, consumers, and environmental groups. These people were the ones that set up the environment for wind power to do what it has done and what it will do. This group right here, the founding members of Texera, are the same folks that had the vision to work. And where did they work? They worked through the Public Utility Commission, ERCOT, which is the regulator, the um, of course, the, the existing power generators weren't that interested, but the distributors were, Centerpoint and Encore. They saw an opportunity to connect more wires to more power generation. The uh, legislators, people that, that, that were involved in um, writing legislation that, that would in um, both both regulate and set up the rules of how it was going to work, but also um, incentivize the marketplace. So, um, and of course, the electricity, commercial, and retail markets, folks from those. Um, this is a very, uh, I, I, I'm pretty sure that this whole group is quite interested in seeing uh, zero emission electric transportation future. I would say that that's right up our bailiwick. Instead of driving through our neighborhoods and driving down our roads and seeing all these gasoline cars, internal combustion vehicles, we see nothing but EVs. And we're sitting there a decade from now, a little older, going, you know, I was one of the first ones that was doing this stuff and I knew it was going to happen in the days. All right, so there's, let me see if I can move. Unfortunately, the banner when I'm sharing my screen is up on top. And I can't get to, all right, so let me slowly 
All right. Etc. So they got a Facebook page. And oh, by the way, I would encourage all of you guys and girls to write, you know, make little notes, take notes, techcetera.org, Facebook page. If you're into Facebook, follow them. Um, I'm going to say it several times. Join them. I'm going to tell you how, who, you know, I'm going to go through the, the, the structure. Um, their mission is to guide and accelerate the adoption of electric transportation in all its forms in the most cost-effective way, providing maximum benefits to the citizens of Texas. They've got goals. 10 million electric vehicles and 75% of all trips to be electric by 2035, 15 years from now. Go to Facebook. Okay. Join us. I'm going to tell, I'm going to go, um, I'm going to, uh, before I talk about joining, I want to do some of the things on this, on this website. So the Public Utility Commission, uh, let me see here. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, they, they have a newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter. Um, the Public Utility Commission put out a, a questionnaire to the marketplace asking how, how we're going to do this. How, what, are, what are the ways that we're going to transition to electric transportation? How are we going to build out the infrastructure to support it? How is the, the uh, ch charging um, cost for the electricity going to be done. Um, recommendations, et cetera, filled out a response to those questions and it's on there and you can go through it and read it to give you just an idea of, of the thought process. And, it, and you guys, I think can see the, the amount of information that that is put out by the public utility commission and the amount of information that's answered they they had of of folks that are involved in tech center which by the way most of them are working for other companies and other entities public the public sector as well and there's some volunteers and they've formed several committees which i'll show here in a minute and and by the way, you uh, you all, if you find an interest, can join join uh, a committee. And they uh, work through answering things like, what is the Public Utility Commission asking? Is the operation of an electric vehicle charging station a retail sale of electricity? That's a really important question. Question number two. That was a PUC asked that. Tech Center said no. Because right now, it's really not answered, but it's being treated somewhat as that by, by the electric, by the charging station folks. Right now, if you get an account with EVgo or you get an account with um, uh, Electrify America or uh, Blink, char car charging group or charge point, you get charged by the minute that you're on that station. You don't get charged by the kilowatt hours that you use. And there's a problem with that. Some cars, if the station's a, a 30 amp station providing 7.2 kilowatts, uh, you know, many of the cars, most of them now will charge at 7.2 kilowatts and have that much electricity delivered to them. Some of them, like the older Leafs, will only charge at six, 3.6 kilowatts, half the rate. But the, the, the poor fella, um, you know, consumer charging the leaf is paying the same amount as the person that's driving the bolt or the Tesla and the bolt or the Tesla are getting twice the electricity. That's a little list. That's an issue. This is going to resolve that. If they can charge you by the kilowatt hour going through that station, it's a much more equitable charge. These are very important foundations 
to what you saw in that curve of the of the wind power generation and what we will see in the electrification of transportation and the development of charging networks and and so don't we want to be involved in those things i do and i know heaa does and i'm pretty sure that several of you are interested so that's that's one uh, one thing to, to, the, that they've done. They're also a, a disseminator of information, very good information. Where is the grant money? Where are the rebates? What kind of programs are out there to, to help you, the consumer, uh, get a better deal on your EV? Very, very good stuff. They've also put together a committee that is analyzing where do we put the charging infrastructure? Where does it make sense? Run them down the corridors. This is an ERCOT map showing where the power line distribution is. Where is the power available? Where is it not available? Where does the infrastructure need to be developed in the future? We don't just want to put charging stations uh, where the population centers are we know that for evs to to actually take over or or, or you know for for evs to be transitioned into general use of the of the transportation we have to have a ch charging network that is going to match the consumption than the user needs. Tesla is the best at that. That's that is you know their their secret sauce. They have built an electric car and built a fueling infrastructure, and 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 they're the most successful. The OEMs, the rest of the OEMs are catching up. Michael's uh, with Lordstown and fleet operators. It's a different market because. Uh, you can you can do the charging infrastructure at the at the hubs for the fleet. They, they, there will be there will be some cases where that fleet vehicle has to go distances, um, and and so they still will tie into Electrify America or others to charge the vehicle. But um, but from the standpoint of the Public Utility Commission and the regulator ERCOT. These kind of analysis are, are fundamental to making EV transition faster. It's going to happen. It's just that if you have a good foundation and you've thought of a lot of these things and you get the groups of people talking about them and developing them and, and you get these relationships, this stuff goes faster. So another, another really important thing that's being done by et cetera. All right. They, 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 they do have, you know, shared news and, and, um, um, let me move this over a little bit. Um, and then, uh, EV incentives is, is the other one. I said grants, that, that was more for, for folks that are buying, uh, charging stations and ports and other things. But the, here's your, here's your EV incentives. This one's related to the consumer. Federal tax credit. Um, there's, uh, you know, TCEQ had a $2,500 rebate and, uh, they were, they had a big push to, um, uh, get, get that, that program, uh, used up. Uh, the money, there was still money left on the table and, and several, there's some really good deals on electric vehicles, uh, right now. Uh, one of the gentlemen that that's involved in Tech Cetera bought a bolt. For, um, I think he said it was a hundred and thirty dollar lease for the law for the for the. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was a Nissan Leaf for the big battery Leaf, which is sixty two kilowatt hours. I think he paid uh, hundred and thirty for the smaller battery Leaf. It's it's eighty seven dollars a month is what it comes out to. Phenomenal deals on electric vehicles. Um, so. Uh, this, this little plug in America tool, plug star, excellent. 
mean, you don't have to come to TechCetera to see it, but it's a it's a car buying guide done by Plug in America. Um, it it's a training tool for dealerships, um, um, and and so excellent excellent information. So excellent information disseminator, TechCetera. All right, uh, here's a list of the committees. They have um, equity. So, you know, we talk a lot about that, that term is being used a lot. Um, and that, uh, that's, that's essentially, um, uh, we, we have different ways of subsidizing things, but, but getting electric vehicle charging infrastructure and, and, um, and used electric vehicles maybe, uh, into the hands of, of, uh, lower income communities, um, benefits all of us because if you have folks that can't afford, uh, to transition electric transportation, uh, driving, you know, non-economic polluting gas vehicles, uh, we're, 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 we're not benefiting from the, from the clean air like we could be. So, so there's, there's the, a, a committee that's, that works on that charging infrastructure committee. We showed you the map. Electric grid impact. There's folks from the utilities, distribution, generation, uh, the retail sector, uh, charging uh, company infrastructure folks. This is where I got introduced to um, uh, Tech Center, and that was EV policy. If y'all remember in 2019, the um, Dealer Association, uh, there, there were a couple of bills that were proposed, um, about electric vehicles. One of them had to do with, uh, trying to lump in the service centers that Tesla had into the dealer franchise ruling. And that would have essentially killed the service centers in Texas. There was a big pushback from Tesla owners. Thank goodness there were many uh, vehicles already here. And many of us went and, and had our three minutes in front of the committees, both in the House, the State House and the State Senate. And uh, a couple of other bills that, that were put forth were vehicle fees because EVs don't use gasoline and therefore they don't pay a gas tax and therefore they're not paying their fair share. This is, you know, the, in quotes of road use. So. What is the fair share? And there were two proposals. One was, or I think three proposals. One was $150 added to your registration. One was $300 added to your registration. And one was $1,000 added to your registration. $1,000 a year added to your registration was done by a fellow that, that has a lot of oil and gas lobby, uh, from, he's from the, uh, Dallas Fort Worth area in the Senate. So, these, these, um, th what came from the lobbying done by TechCetera was that it was sent to, uh, the Texas Transportation Institute and, um, and one other agency to figure out what would be an equitable fee to charge electric vehicles so that they can participate and helping to pay for the roads. And I know that some of us think, well, you know, EVs are still, we've got to pay more for the vehicles and, and, uh, it's, it's, we're still jumping. We're kind of still, uh, first adopters and, and you're going to stifle folks from switching over if you charge an extra fee. But the reality is that, uh, it, like in most things in politics, and we haven't seen that much of it, but, but you have to have a compromise. So why not, instead of just say no and, and have it done anyways, because you lose the, the vote, why not be part of what the solution is going to be? And so Texadera is, has done that. And I'm going to show you guys an example of what they're filing in this next session, which is an omnibus bill, which is going to have a, a tremendous amount of information 
that is that is indicative of the foundation of, of electric vehicles um, in the marketplace in Texas. So EV policy, dealer outreach. That's another. There's there's a fellow on on the in the group uh, at Tech Center. His name is uh, Buzz. Uh, is it Smith? I'll have to remind. I just forgot his name. Buzz. Buzz. Oh, there's his name. Buzz Smith. Yeah, the evangelist. Buzz is in, in charge of this committee, and he uh, he sold cars, and he he got into selling electric vehicles <laughs> he he was one of these guys that you'd wish you'd get to when you're you know you know when you when you're thinking you're going to buy an electric vehicle and you go to the dealer and you walk up to the the sales guys you walk up to you right the first one and he says how can i help you and he said i'm i'm interested in buying the nissan leaf and the guy says you don't want to leave that's things that the battery's going to quit the that the, the, the. what you want is the nissan murano because i've got a whole bunch of those sitting on the floor and I, those I can make some money with. I, it, so anyway, Buzz was the guy that was, I've, I'm glad you came to me because I'm going to tell you all the great things there are about buying this electric car. And so he, he, um, he's, he's got, you can watch tons of videos from him. He's, he's really got a great attitude and, uh, all right. Public transit. Several of us have worked with uh Houston Metro and uh my goodness we just uh we just um you know work so hard to try to get them to move and they just don't don't move but electric buses are are coming they're here they're the agencies cities municipalities are buying them like crazy um the trains uh are electrifying um so public transit is is another committee that's again working on the foundation, taking the challenges, existing challenges, trying to work through them, you know, per perfecting the sales pitch. TURP, um, Texas Emission uh, Reduction Program. Uh, actually, that's TURP is who had the the uh, $2,500 rebate. Um, and the use of the VW settlement money. Where can we put all that? Um, what was it, 150 billion that we got in the state of Texas? Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on the number, but it was a bunch of money. Maybe it was 25 billion. Uh, a lot of money. 209 million, sorry. Not billion, but million. Uh, what, what do we do with the money? How do we build out the infrastructure? Public education have a, which we do. Uh, technology committee. Um, basically is tracking trends, economic development. How do we, how do we change, Michael? This is kind of the idea of, of how do we present to entities that are kind of purchasing vehicles in, a, in an old way of looking at things where it's all segmented into different buckets. How do we, how do we get the purchase guy and the fuel guy and the, and the maintenance guy all in the same room with the with the money guys, the finance guys, and the leader, and say, look at let's look at this whole thing. Because as you said, the UPS and others, they look at total cost of ownership, but some of the public entities don't. So that's the committees. All right. Um uh, the staff, electric school buses, they have a a, a thing on electric school buses, Texas legislature. So that brings me to Texas legislature. It's going to have a session. It's going to be weird this year with uh, COVID. Uh, won't be able to uh, go uh, like we have in the past to um, uh, be in, in session in, in committee sessions, the rules. I think you're going to have to um, make a reservation 24 hours in advance. Uh, seating will be limited. Uh, they'll, they, they should have uh, virtual uh, abilities to access the committees virtually. Um, so those things will be will be spelled out. But I wanted to show you guys, and I hope you can see it. This is the bill that was drafted by Texetera uh, committees, staff, and lobbyists on on retainer that they have to 
build the foundation of an act relating to mobile source emission reduction and transportation electrification authorizing fees. Um, be it enacted. So it's written in, in the legislative ease and it is, you can read it on the, on the, uh, actually send me an email or send Dave an email if you want to read it. I, I got a copy of it, 31 pages. So um, I wanted to finish with, oh, my banner keeps coming down. Let me see if I can. I'll get that out of the way. All right, membership. So I wanted to show this screen because these are the people that are members of of the of et cetera, Texas Electric Transportation Resource. And you've got, you know, folks with, with deeper pockets like vehicle manufacturers, charging equipment manufacturers, providing electric power generators. Um, so people that produce electricity, retailers, and transmission providers. Now, why do folks join TechCetera with $5,000? Is it because they are going to pressure TechCetera into doing what they want? No, TechCetera is, has their their goal is to promote electric transportation in Texas, have the transition. These folks want to be part of the foundation building that we've just you know been reviewing. They want to be part of the process. They actually, many of them, if not all of them, see an opportunity to to actually uh, join the market. So. Um, they even have, so that's class B at 5,000. Class C would be dealers. They've reached out to dealers. They say, you know what? Yes, Tesla and the dealers have a big fight, but we, we feel that the dealership franchise network is 50 years old in Texas. If we make it our mission to fight for, for Tesla's fight, um, we, we're, we're not going to get uh, headway. And so we're, we're going to allow them to be part of the group. We're going to work. And, and yet we have folks that, that are, that are Tesla, um, enthusiasts. And you know what? Uh, many of the folks and I agree with it. You don't put a, what is the gig Texas, uh, giga factory? Is it a $2 billion factory with 5,000 employees? And going to produce 500,000 vehicles, and you got SpaceX down in the in the valley and up in Central Texas, and you have all this investment. Uh, the, let the billionaires fight the billionaires <laughs> is the idea. <laughs> Tesla will get its get its. Uh, we will have direct OEM sales uh, eventually, and and um, and and the dealer networks will have to transition to. To a different way of shopping, just like Amazon's changing changing the um, the brick and mortar store. Um, so, anyways, uh, class uh, D engineers, attorneys, consultants, folks that that have um, another another uh, set of skills, subject matter experts that want to join, want to promote promote this. Look at owner of electric transportation. That's all of us. And it's free. You can join TechCetera for free. Get their newsletter and, and participate as much or as little as you want to. Why do they say that? Because they want to show the legislators and the PUC and, uh, and others that they talk to. Look how many folks are interested, how many folks that, that, that have joined us as members and are interested in this, you know, get a hundred thousand EV owners behind you, two hundred thousand, and people start to listen. And so, I would encourage all of us at HEAA to join TechCetera. Doesn't cost you a thing, and it helps the helps the movement, helps helps what we want. Um, and then we have non-voting members. 
and uh, associate members, individual companies, and nonprofit organizations. And I went to our leadership, and they graciously said, "Yeah, this is a good organization. We'll we'll put in a hundred dollars a year to be a nonprofit, and um, and we will uh, be part of TechCetera. And that's who we are. And then student members, if you're if you're accredited, uh, you're in an, an organization, you don't have an ED, but you're interested in this, they have a $50 annual fee. So um, that's TechCetera. I'm on the board at TechCetera. Um, uh, we, we certainly have several others that, that um, and I would ping y'all if I can't make a meeting, which, which by the way, tomorrow is the next meeting. Um, if, if anybody can attend, uh, if anybody, Dave, if you're willing to attend uh, tomorrow, I need to get the time, but I, I, it slipped my mind to pass, pass that on, but I'd, I'd love somebody to fill in just to, um, and I would tell them. So that is uh, TechCetera. I think I've covered, uh, let me see, stop share. Let's go on. I think I've covered all of it. So if anybody has a question, let's see. Are everybody's anybody sleeping? <laughs> That's one of the problems with Zoom is that you tend to have you know one person speaking and everyone else is muted to try to keep background noise down, and then you don't hear people's ahas uh and I agree or other things that you would in a live meeting. So yeah, that's that's one of the downsides of Zoom type meetings. But uh, I found that really interesting, all the things. And we've got some comments in the chat from Colin, including a link to our HEAA.org YouTube channel, which he graciously worked on setting up. So you can work through our website or through Facebook or go directly to YouTube and get the videos of our meetings. Um, the other things like the presentations, it's best to go to the .org website. Um, and then you can see the actual slides that people put out and, and uh, see a, a trail of what we've been uh, covering in our meetings. Uh, but uh, that's great to know how much farther in advance uh, TechCetera has been working. And uh, I didn't realize you were on the board, so that's really good. You've gotten deeply involved. Yeah, I, um, I thought I told you guys, but but maybe I didn't. Maybe I told you that I was trying to get on the board, or they had asked me to be on the board. Um, there's, there's uh, Rick Bowler from Dallas that uh, represents the Tesla Group up there, and also uh, North Tech, um, one the EV Association up there is on. Or the fellow from Austin is on. So, uh, Electric Auto Association is well represented, um, and. Uh, Yes, Colin, we, we had a presentation on TechCetera, but I wanted to uh, um, do, do a refresh and, and I think expand a little bit on what they've done because they've done a lot more, including the omnibus bill. Um, so uh, it's- I'm not complaining. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's, uh, let me see, anybody it's, it's, else have a question? Or it, comment. It's an active organization, and as you say, the issues keep on changing and evolving, and and so forth. And uh, we see the bills introduced, like by the uh, one member uh, in the Texas legislature, about a thousand dollar a year uh, proposed fee, and and things like that. And that's how those things get implemented: is people not being active and and keeping up on what groups like et cetera are doing, and and. Uh, speaking up at the right times. Um, yeah, the, the way things get negotiated, you never know what might get accepted if people aren't standing up and saying that's unacceptable. Dave, did you go to the, did you, you went uh, in 2019 to the, to the Senator House Committee hearing? No, you? I didn't, didn't make it over to Austin that time. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you guys, I think I said this and, and, and maybe you, you can tell me I did, but uh, you go, if you have never been to the Texas legislature, I highly recommend it. Um, it is so interesting to see 
the dynamics of how the committees work, how it all works, and, you, and it's very complicated. So you, you're not going to, you know, just by going one time. But what you see is lobbyists, lots of attorneys, um, people that are in the public sector that that want to be represented. They're there. You don't see individuals. You don't see the voters. You don't see the people that elect these folks. We, we hope that they do uh, things in our best interest, but the reality is that they listen. They, d they do what, what they hear. And um, if they're only hearing from public interest for, from private interests and, and, and lobbyists, that's, that's what ha gets done. Um, the, Assistant Chairman of the Senate, Senate Committee, which, by the way, had heard among many was the one bill on a on $1,000 uh, fee. He said something that really uh, impressed me, and it, and it told me that these folks, they really do, for the most part, feel a, need, a, a, a desire to serve the public. And they want to hear from the public. And what he said to us was, I want to congratulate those of you that have taken time out of your life, your working life and family life, you citizens of the state that have come before us and participated in these hearings. And then he said the next, which was, it is very unusual for us to see that but we appreciate it very much. And, and I, you know, how can we complain about things that, that, that go on if we don't at least, uh, you know, express the will, the will that we have. So, so, uh, you know, it, it's, this group is, is really, uh, what, what, what I'm really attracted about this group is that, they get things done. They get things done. Um, uh, we, I, I'm really impressed um, sitting in on, on, on the meetings and listening to, to folks, a lot of knowledgeable folks and getting a lot of stuff done. I feel really good about, about electrification. Um, uh, the marketplace will respond. Speaking of electrification in the chat, um, Robert put in the comment from uh, Elizabeth Spike about how she's working to get lower income folks into EVs. So that's uh, good for folks that want to uh, push that along. You know, uh, Robert, that's a, that's a, ah, I haven't thought about that, but we should get Elizabeth connected to um, Texadera uh, because there's, there's a whole committee that's dealing with that, um, and and uh, she could compare notes. So let me let me get her connected to um, um, the right folks at Texadera. That that's a great point. Thank you. Yep, that's good. All right, um, just to talk a little bit about uh, charging here. Um, some folks have been asking about that, so. Uh, Any time here these last uh, few minutes, um, we can talk about, uh, uh, so related to what Kevin brought up about where across the state charging should be, uh, as well as uh, standards and uh, pricing. Uh, as you said, Kevin, uh, it's come kind of problematic uh, a number of states to be charged per minute. It uh, varies a lot and what people really wanna buy are kilowatt hours. Um, so do folks have some uh, things they want to say about charging? Can I talk a little bit here? Yes, please. Sure. Um, I found it very interesting. Um, my thought on charging electric cars, most of the time it's done in the, in the evening at the dark hours when other loads are not on. So you're using your capacity there. How about charging when the wind is blowing <laughs> and, and make the, just make it cheaper when the wind is blowing because that's when you should be charging on the thing. And I, I thought that was kind of interesting. And I, I guess my big problem or thinking is how about storage and, and uh, off-peak 
things. Um, 55 years ago, I was on, my company assigned me to be a group there because my, I was a gas pipeline company and our customers, we were very fearful that we were going to lose the residential heating market to electricity. And, and so that was my job to get that stopped. Well, we run out of gas. And so they stopped my thing anyway, but it was, it was a real, and it, we had, I, we, I was a member of GATE, Group to Advance Total Energy. And it was a, we took a little generator and used the hot water off of it and the engine heat to create other things. So it made it really group to advance. It was very efficient. The thing did not work because the electricity people, utilities wouldn't give us standby power. So we had to put in two if you wanted to make it work. We, the only things we were successful with, we sold to some Christian brother schools because they could do it and they were intelligent people. They could check the water and the oil and all this. Other. And if it went down, they could cancel the class <laughs> and, and go home. And so that they could afford to do that and it saved them some money. It was an interesting project, but I, 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 I'm interested to know how the battery system is going to work. And your 18% uh, percent of electricity, uh, uh, how much of that was stored uh, somewhere and then used again? Uh, do you follow my question? I mean, yeah, there, yeah there's no, a points there. Before you go going on that, Kevin, I can just say right now the amount of storage is very small, but it is growing quickly. So, Kevin. Yeah, sorry, Dave. I, um, Dale, that's that's exactly right. Um, storage is is coming online, primarily um initially in small quantities where you're not storing all the excess power so they, they they're still um there's still some variability with with wind um but a couple of things that 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 have happened is that in texas we have phenomenal wind resources that oppose each other and i and what i mean is that the West Texas wind blows at night. The Gulf Coast wind blows during the day. And what they've what what they've done is um, they're they're finding that complementing renewable resources are you know building them in different places. We've, we've got these massive wind farms now in South Texas along the coast, and um, their uh, the the variability has been reduced. I think I, I heard something like 70% um, by, by having, you know, different re wind resources. And now with the addition of solar, even more so, uh, complementing the transmission lines, using the transmission lines out at West Texas, which are highly utilized at night by wind, but very underutilized during the day. They're putting solar out there and running the power during the, during the day and benefiting not only because the, the lines uh, are, are underutilized, but also because it's almost an hour later on, on, the, on the solar curve out in West Texas. So you get the benefit to shift the, the power about an hour, which is, which is more in line when the, the east side of the state is being used. Um, but in addition to that, uh, storage is coming in. There, there are um uh several uh for the last year and a half uh, um uh projects that have been built that are bidding in uh renewables solar primarily and uh storage and the storage that they're building again is not to to capture all of the excess energy but what it does is it gives you enough energy so that the variability doesn't have to be backed up by gas immediately. You don't have to have gas generators that are standing by for the, for the variability. You can actually have the variability happen, the, the, the drop. You take that stored energy and gives you 20, 30 minutes to start up the generators and get them online. And that's a big savings. They're, they're saving 10 to 20%. 
on on fuel costs and time on those generators. So that's continuing uh, uh, to happen. Um, and you know, uh, eventually, what we're going to see, uh, Dale, is is the use of of the electric vehicle transportation infrastructure is going to be part of the storage component. Uh, we've been talking about it for years, but you're going to have vehicle to grid, vehicle to home, uh, vehicle to building, and uh, and and these uh, utility um, retailers and uh, commercial uh, sellers are going to be making uh, incentive programs for you to have your EV plugged in and and uh, a few kilowatt hours taken out of your battery pack, um, um, and so. Uh, it's it's exciting. It's happening. Um, uh, Dale, you've you've seen a whole bunch of stuff in your in your lifetime. I've I've seen uh, you know uh, we hadn't been we hadn't. This is not uh, the dark ages in Europe where nothing changed for four hundred years. This has been quite an exciting uh, uh, century, and this next one is is rip roaring. One other comment on terms of the wind and the storage is that there's been uh, efforts to use excess wind to electrolyze water and break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. And then you can use that hydrogen as an en energy carrier in various ways. You can actually inject up to 15%, I believe it is, into the natural gas pipelines. Or of course, you can just use it to then turn it back into electricity again when uh, you need it to match the demand curve. And uh, something interesting that I've learned recently, in Arizona, they have so much solar now during the day that in the winter time, when there is low demand for electricity, they have what they call super off-peak. And the super off-peak hours are right in the middle of the day. So we're all used to off-peak being referred to as nighttime. So Dale, you mentioned about uh, cars charging at night and so forth. And of course that matches with the West Texas wind, but in the winter months, there is so much uh, electricity generated from solar now. And because in the winter time, there's less electricity demand than during the summer when there's a lot of air conditioning running. They've actually created the category of time of use called super off peak. And uh, it's right in the middle of the day in the winter time. When you when we, at the same time I was doing that, we give a whole bunch of money, my company did, to uh, hydro, uh, hi, fuel cells. We were going to have fuel cells. This was in, in uh, 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 the late 60s, and we spent a lot of money because we were going to use fuel cells, and natural gas was going to be the supply for them. Well, oh, you collect your, your muted, muted by mistake, but yeah, yeah uh, something is hydrogen is hydrogen is the the joke is that it's the technology that's just around the corner and always always will be, but that's not true. It will, you know, be part of the future, um, and we still have to keep putting uh, resources into developing hydrogen. Um, uh, the 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 bad thing about hydrogen is that it has been used by some of the the folks that uh, want to delay the transition by saying it's the silver bullets right around the corner and it's and it's it's now and unfortunately it isn't uh, the the transportation distribution of hydrogen is a challenge we don't have a, 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 a cost equitable way to do that. Um, so we're coming up with cost equitable ways of producing it using uh, excess renewable energy. Uh, one of the things I would say about Arizona, um, Dave, with excess power in the wintertime, um, you, you, most of your heating, I would imagine, is with natural gas. And as people realize that the cost of electricity is actually cheap, you will actually see heating transition to electric heat, both in, in, in uh, you know, uh, actual uh, uh, heat resistance heating, but, but more importantly, um, in heat pumps and, um, and um, 
hot water systems for heat, uh, radiator systems, uh, even floored heat. And uh, I think you'll see a, a transition that'll be good because um, uh, because it you know will reduce the the use of fossil fuels for for heat in the winter time. It's so, good that you brought up heat pumps because uh, in some of the latest cars, EVs coming out as opposed to resistant heat, they're now switching over to heat pumps because they're more efficient. Yeah, absolutely. Both, of course, using electricity is the source of powering the system that provides the heat, but you get more heat out of a heat pump than you do just turning electricity through a resistor into heat. So we're kind of at the end here. This has been great. Kevin, thanks for all the things that you've brought up. Any other uh, comments? I see there's something in the chat about nuclear fusion. Um, yeah, that's also similar to what you said, Kevin, the joke about it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, the 30 years, I think I've even heard, it's 30 years in the future and always will be. So that's the joke on the nuclear fusion. But uh, apparently there's some, some recent work going on. So I don't know where that stands nowadays. Um, but uh, good, any other last comments from folks here? This has been exciting. Thanks, Kevin. Glad to do it. Thanks for- Happy New Happy Year. New Year. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we have successfully gotten through 2020. And uh, of course, we're all waiting for the success of getting past the uh, restrictions that the COVID virus have placed on society. And uh, so we'll, we'll come through the other side of this here in 2021, I think. And, uh, Dave, have you, um, have you had any talks with, um, with uh, T uh, RX Labs? Uh, I've, I've been asking Bill Swan and he has been in contact with Roland. Okay. And so he's gotten word back that yes, they are aware that we want to make use of their classroom and, and so forth. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cause we're all looking forward to when we can meet again in person. Yes. <laughs> By the way, one thing I didn't mention, I forgot to mention the, the, the suggested fee is going to be a hundred dollars. Okay. So by and, and I've yeah, I've often said to people, it's not like people who drive EVs are are trying to get away with something, you know, but we just want to look at, you know, what does actual road use cost? Um, maybe we should put more excise tax on tires since all the vehicles use tires, uh, as opposed to the fuel, because then it becomes more fuel agnostic in terms of providing funding for our roads or or that they should come more out of general taxes or something. Um, since even people that aren't driving on the roads buy products that have been driven in vehicles across roads and things like that. So diff different ways to uh, address the funding needs for the roads. They, they uh, looked at so many different things, uh, speaking with different um, uh, revenue management agencies within the state. And one of the huge limiters, for example, you know, you get your car inspected every year, the mileage is recorded, right? So you know how many miles that vehicle drove without having to track it. People have talked about tracking, you know, and all that. The thing is that that information is not shared with, with, with the agencies that would actually instigate the taxes. And even if it was, they don't have the hardware and software capacity of, of, of putting that into, into place. We've got computer systems in public agencies that are 20 years old and running very old software. And uh, so, so the investment to upgrade those things, you know, has not, has not, they haven't found the value in doing that yet. So there's all of these, that, that if you go to these meetings and listen, you start realizing you know how, how complex it is so the easiest thing is to just add a fee at the registration level that is somewhere around what a uh, uh, 3500 pound uh, vehicle for light vehicles uh, driving uh, you know 10,000 miles a year uh, uh, generates and and so that's that's the fee sure what using the averages helps mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that they talk about is that once you get 
end of the conversation and you start with a baseline, you can always be part of the group that, that has input to adjust it and refine it. So as capabilities come, come to pass at other agencies, the, the, this could be transitioned in, in, le in future legislative sessions. And so, um, but a hundred dollars is a, is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's probably as close to a fair contribution to the highway, uh, fund as can be done in present day. All right. So if there aren't any other comments, we will wrap it up for tonight and for this month. So we will uh, continue on next month. Hope to see everybody there. Actually kind of wish that we'd had a couple of our other good friends that like talking about batteries, like the uh, the Sweet Brothers or Robert Powell. They, they didn't make it on tonight. They probably would have had questions for our speaker for, from Lordstown as well. So, all right, thanks everybody. And uh, like I said, keep looking at the website and so forth. All right, take care, bye-bye.